Good evening, and welcome to Freedom Free for All's Roundtable, the show that pokes the new world order, and it's all seeing eye. My name is Josh Steffler, and tonight Brad Rhodes joins me on the roundtable as we interview our special guest, Dana Dunford of the Nuclear Proctologist. Org. We will be talking about Fukushima. You know, when was the last time you heard about Fukushima on television? Now, for our Shaw viewers watching at home, you're watching a pre-recorded episode. We broadcast this show live every Tuesday night on the internet at freedomfreeforall.com and on our YouTube channel. So come to us online and you can actually ask questions of our guests next week. You're not watching it right now online, so you won't get your questions in, but email us if you have questions and we'll get them to our guest at comments at freedomfreeforall.com. We will be right back after a short update from our friends over at World Alternative Media and we'll get right into the interview with Dana Dunford. Hey everybody, Josh Sirton, World Alternative Media here, and we're proud partners with the guys at Freedom Free For All and We Are Change Victoria. This week at Wham, we talk with Eric July, who is a vocalist of Backwards, and he is also an ANCAP slash libertarian slash altogether a really interesting guy, and we can't wait to bring that to you. We're also talking with economic analyst and author John Snyson about the insolvency of the Bank of Canada. That's right, it's bankrupt. Go figure. I mean, it's pretty obvious at this point in time after the gold has been sold off from our country and we're printing ourselves into oblivion. We're bringing you this and much more at Wham, so stay tuned. You can find us on Facebook, YouTube and Twitter and of course at worldalternativemedia.com. Okay, welcome back to Freedom Free For All's Roundtable. Tonight's guest, Dana Dunford, comes to us from Vancouver. We've got him on the phone, and we're talking about Fukushima. It's been five years since the nuclear disaster over there. Uh, Dana, would you like to introduce yourself to our viewers at home? Thank you. Hi, folks. I'm Dana Dunford, also known as nuclearproctologist.org, and we're an independent research organization and we are um, the most active on Fukushima it seems to be uh, worldwide uh, disseminating accurate information and so we like to put that out there too is that uh, we're not just activists we actually went out on the ocean for 260 days and done 15,000 miles of the Canadian coastline. Wow. 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 How did you do that? What sort of a vessel do you have? Uh, 25 foot Coast Guard Zodiac with aluminum cabin on it. That's cool. And then I have a little little Zodiac on the roof of that. Uh, it's got the diesel stove and everything on it. And so up to five months, believe it or not, uh, without coming home, 260 days total, a couple hundred thousand pictures of the coastline, an extraordinary amount of underwater footage. Uh, I'm an ex-commercial diver on top of that. And so I really know the coastline really well. So maybe you could tell our viewers some of the things that you saw on the coastline. Um, like, why are you concerned sure. about the Fukushima? What got you to get in a boat and go travel the coastline? And what were you looking for? Originally, we were going to go out and do a species count. And so British Columbia, I'm in Georgia Street in Powell River. And we have uh, a known number of indigenous species on the coastline of British Columbia that are residential species is probably a better way of looking at it. And that would include 600 algaes, 78 species of sea anemones. Each species of sea anemones come in multiple colors, very vibrant colors. And the same thing with the starfish, 76 species. There's 480 species of worms on the coastline. There's all the shellfish, the mollusks, the periwinkles, the snails, there's the clams, the oysters, the manillas, the little neck clams, there's the scallops and abalone, gooey doctors, just uh, incredible diversity just in uh, Georgia Street. Now, Berkeley Sound, anybody from British Columbia is quite familiar with Berkeley Sound, mm -hmm. would have an extra 800 of those species. And British Columbia doesn't get ice in the winter, and so it's a perfect... Uh, place to look for uh, healthy species where you don't have the, like on the east coast of Canada we have a pack ice 200 miles off the coastline thick scrubbing the coastline where you don't have that in British Columbia so they have a year round population that is uh, extraordinarily studied and now you have another 6500 species in the tidal pools, these are all tidal pool uh, is what I specialized in and there's another 6500 species of invertebrates without the backbones, they're like little small shrimp 
and that the, the theory was we would see the most damage at the most vulnerable part of the ocean, which would be the microscopic world, and would translate into the tidal zones themselves. They, are, they were the most vulnerable. And so when the clouds were coming across from Japan, the postulation was that they would hit the mountains and then everything runs back down towards the coastline. Yeah. But doesn't get hung up in estuaries and lakes and rivers and streams and everything. It's used to cool the coastline. So these temperatures from, or these waters from the mountains are really important also for cooling the coastline. Uh, at the same time, we noticed that uh, pack ice was missing from the mountains of British Columbia. And that's probably why we see such a big failure of the fisheries along the coastline like salmon and stuff like that because they didn't have that extra water coming down from the mountains and they didn't have the temperatures regulating the streams and the estuaries and, and the rivers. That was a byproduct uh, discovery of looking at the tidal poles through British Columbia. So the theory was to go out and get samples originally and they had thousands and thousands of bags to get samples uh, but the, the species were missing. Now, if anybody's familiar, there's another 4.2 million species in the Pacific Ocean. And so they should reseed really the coastline. And another way to look at it was that if you were to go down and plow in a healthy coastline, yeah. was, like British Columbia, it's spectacular, then the creatures from deeper on both sides and the ocean that is the super life itself would fill up that gap almost immediately within a week or two. It would start almost being filled right up because the ocean is the soup of life. And yeah. that yeah. glass, yeah, a glass of salt water would have a billion creatures, not counting the eggs and larvae and... And then when you look at glass of salt water in British Columbia right now, it's very difficult to find any life in it. And so it, it, it's quite alarming to try to talk about the subject. And I'll just uh, put it in, because we know we're pressed for time, was that we counted 100 species, uh, species symmetrically throughout the entire coastline total. Oh. We also done an in insect species count, and we also done a bird count yeah. for 260 days on this coastline. And so the bird species is down to 11 species that I've seen um, photographed throughout the whole coastline. And that the insects were down to probably 1,000 of what they should be. 1% to 1% of what should be out there wow. is so what I discovered. And so the 4.2 million species hadn't receded the coastline. And so the original expedition was only supposed to last a couple of months as an exploratory. Uh, we ended up having to look at the entire coastline. So not only... Did we do the, all the interior? We also done, I done the west coast on the last expedition, the open ocean itself, and that was a really tough trip. But it was, um, that's where all the life should be. You should find anything extra, you would find it on the west coast. In, in regards now, to that, I have a, I have a question ahead. on the chat here. It says, where's the list of the missing species, they want to know. Is there a list or a, a compiling, is anyone compiling the list? There's around uh, 575 species of algae are missing. Uh, 70, 73 uh, species of uh, sea enemies are missing. 70 species of starfish were missing. Almost 100% of the 480 species of worms are missing. Where can we acquire and this information? Is there a website? For me, there's a nuclearproctologist.org, and but what I'm doing. What, you, what the species that I'm using are based upon pre-studies here in British Columbia. And um, Banfield is one of the, the best ones to think about, where they have 71 universities. But this whole coastline uh, was studied. Now, my, my, my studies are from the government. And so anybody can go to the government and look for the species of the coastline. Yeah. Well, I, that's the, that's the better way to do it than, than me providing everything. Okay, we have... In the context of... Go ahead, I'm sorry. We have some people uh, who... Uh, uh, he says uh, he does not name any species that are missing. Uh, did you test any uh, sea life for radiation, and where are the results? So I guess somebody's... Right, yeah, no, sure. And, but that would be the normal way you would look at it. You, you would have some... You would go out and, and literally try to take the, the species, but there's no species out there. And so the species are not there, I can't get samples of it. Okay. And so there, there's a concerted effort to smear me on the internet uh, outrageously when I had the documentation to the entire coastline posted up as a nuclear proctologist with the GPSs. And so, I, you know, uh, it's ludicrous when anyone suggests that 
Well, what I'm saying is unfactual because the documentation itself is already provided at the nuclear proctologist. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, the species yeah, are well known on the coastline. Right. These are well known right. species to the coastline. Yeah. Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no. I should uh, It's just, uh, this is a great uh, um, uh, place to have uh, the discrepancies uh, brought forward. And uh, I'm, 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 I'm not on anyone's side here. I'm just trying to... Uh, no, absolutely. They, they, are, they are trying to uh, suggest that uh, your information is questionable, and uh, they're asking for proof. So, on that, we have to go to... Go ahead, I'm sorry. We have to go to a quick message or a short update from our uh, partners on... We've got a short video to run, and we'll be right back. Hold on, hold on. Yeah, so these rat cards you picked up from Sophia Smallsome are amazing. I see lines like this in a oh, squamal yeah. all the time. I go to Y all over Lankford and Victoria, and you ever notice how they mush into that white mush all over the sky? Just yeah, I take pictures of them everything. all the time. Do you take pictures like this anytime? Because we could use your pictures. So send us your pictures and your name to comments at freedomfreeforall.com and we'll give you some of these rat cards to give to your friends. Okay, welcome back to Freedom Free For All. For you watching, for you people watching on Shaw, this is a pre-recorded program. You can watch us live every Tuesday night on the internet, YouTube at 7.30 p.m. Tuesday nights. We're talking with Dana Dunford about Fukushima, and there was questions asked about the validity of his research and the studies that he do, he's done on the, uh, the missing animals and species. So, Dana, if you could continue where we left off. Well, for starters, you know, I'm a researcher and documentation is up here, and for people to use this uh, interview as a, as a beat me, where's your proof routine, is pretty nonsense. Uh, the documentation is up at the website, the studies are out there through all your universities, institutions, and in your libraries, published in books of the species on the coastline. I can't look that around with me, I can't give it to you when you're on a telephone on the other side of the world. So to speak, yeah, and so to, to, for people to accuse me of being disingenuous, uh, they, are, they first got to say that Fukushima didn't happen, and that the jet streams are not real, and that the ocean currents are not real, and that the species I'm talking about are not real, and this is a ploy to smear me and demonize me and marginalize me and vilify me, but it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't have anything tangible to it, and what it does is it gets the listeners now at Shaw Cable and everywhere else to start to doubt my words when my words are, are backed up by the documentation at my website. I can't lug that around and I can't just telegraph that yeah. and everything. So for, yeah. so for so our viewers... What, what I'm trying to say to you is that the, the disposition throughout the country is well known. Yeah. Once it lands here, it's never going to go away. And so we have the documentation of 220 million beckles per liter of rainwater in Vancouver. And this was only done in 129 with a 50 million year half life. And so all the material that comes out of the chain reaction is man-made. It's not created by the sun. The sun creates about 160 emitters. Now these emitters are not capable of mutating fruit flies or anything else or harming humans. We are acclimated to that through genetic superior selection. Stuff from a chain reaction is why we have terrorist laws and nuclear waste sites and nuclear repositories. And the stuff from a chain reaction uh, everybody, uh, you go to the studies of Dr. Raymond Gilmetti from the Respiratory Research Institute in New Mexico, who studied the uh, effects of beagle dogs and beagle puppies for 35 years. He's actively still doing that. And all the dogs died within five years from the exposure to the man-made radiation. And so the radiation that came across has been studied heavily. What I went out and done was got the scoop in the tidal pools where the academics went and allegedly looked at tuna, which is ridiculous because it's way up the food chain. You most, if you're going to look at it, you would look at the phytoplankton or the krill or the sardines or the herring or the anchovies, which, by the way, are missing from the Pacific Ocean and the industries have collapsed two years in a row. Yeah, wasn't there then, a oh, huge... Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Wasn't there a huge species collapse or like a, a collapse of sardines in the Pacific Ocean recently? And the herring and squid. And the herring and the squid. And okay. And these are the migratory animals uh, yeah. dependent upon uh, for mass migratory. And you would get blooms of these, uh, I call them blooms, but they, uh, about 500 square miles of krill. So all the whales that had died on our coast. 
coastline in the last year or two, in particular, it started to get, they went from 12 inches of blubber down to 4 inches of blubber. Oh. The half a million birds that died, the murders that just died recently a few weeks ago up in Alaska and northern British Columbia, they actually started that also. And there was over half a million up now, so normally when they would come, they couldn't find their squid or their herring or anchovy or, or such type of food or krill. They would come into the soil zones, they would eat all the insects, they would eat the, the snails, the mollusks, they would eat the algae, they would eat the 6,500 invertebrates in the soil zones, and they, they would sustain themselves. So they would go into the forest and eat all the insects. These birds were found uh, at lakes in, inside of uh, Alaska, saltwater birds never seen before, 8,000 in one section of the lake, and they had also started to get too, so they did go all the way in to the interior coastline, and the species were missing. But for proof of it, uh, of radiation, we have study after study after study of major institutions, Simon Fraser University. We have Harvard, Yale, Berkeley, Stanford, MIT, Oxford, came out with, about Fukushima originally in the disposition. We have models from Australia, New Zealand, we have, sorry, France, Canada, we have NOAA, we have the Rice uh, in the URA project. We have endless disposition fallouts of just a single release from a single reactor. We don't have any models based upon the actual release from all the reactors. And that each reactor in Japan is three times the size of Chernobyl. Chernobyl is one third the size. Chernobyl stopped after 10 days. Chernobyl was a 30% meltdown. Chernobyl didn't have reactor cores on the roof. In Japan, we have uh, four reactors with reactor cores. This is five million pounds per reactor core on the roof. And that is gone. The roofs are gone from these buildings. This is thousands and thousands of Chernobyls. And the problem with Chernobyl was that it, the only thing about Chernobyl was to stop after 10 days. Fukushima did not stop. Fukushima is also right on the ocean. And the, jet, the ocean current comes across at five miles per hour, 24 hours a day. And in 45 days, it's here. Now, if it was just a single plume, we'd be looking at a plume coming across. It wasn't just a plume. It's non-stop. A perpetual motion. They're actually also uh, burning it in the incinerators throughout Japan. And we know from the models of forest fires, automobile pollutions, which are tens of thousands of times bigger than the atoms we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And it's such a big volume that came out of Japan. It's still coming out of there. They're in a chain reaction. We might never stop that. And that uh, we have study after study after study of the original disposition. And I had Geiger counters and I got. I was showing Geiger counter readings on my videos this morning, yesterday morning on my live show, on the radio show with Jeff Francis last night. Yeah. And the Geiger counter right now is uh, averaging around 200 pounds per minute. Germany, five back rolls, uh, you got to throw the food away. And so Germany has the right standard where Canada keep raising the limits and they keep claiming. Uh, now the studies have shown that a single back hole, a single uh, atom, will give you a cancer in 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. But there's 1,800 autoimmune deficiencies, uh, diseases, injuries that will show up. Like Alzheimer's, oh. dementia, autism, there's diabetes, there's heart, liver, lung, respiratory, pituitary, adrenaline gland problems will show up, and serious problems before the cancer, those cancers the last one to show up. Now, nuclear power plants, there's six times more breast cancer around nuclear power plants, there's 22% more child leukemia within a 15 mile study of nuclear power plants. But if you really want to see the damage, you would look at autism and, and diabetes around the power plants to really appreciate how uh, that and how many facets this actually uh, causes. There's over, like you see, once again, 1,800 diseases. So when I done the west coast of British Columbia, Canada, I was methodical. I posted all the documentation up at the nuclear proctologist, and that is for academics, that is for journalists, that is for people that are already basically in the know, need that confirmation, need that documentation. I have another Anyway, Anybody want to go ahead? I'm sorry. Um, he, I, I don't... Uh understand it it says uh what if if that is the case where is the gcms report i don't know what gcms report is is but they're asking right, yeah. for that and i don't know either so it's hard to answer the question that we don't know what it is sorry about that so, okay, the person that is posting there in the comment section is not po is voracious and vicious and is slanderous and has made very uh, salacious statements before I even started the live stream. Who is that? These people, uh, whoever was in the comments section posting questions earlier, 
is, is not trying to ask me questions. They're physically and verbally rather attacking me uh, with, okay. without merit. So my studies. Go ahead. I, I got a question for you. Why do you call yourself the nuclear proctologist? Why, why is your website called thenuclearproctologist.org? Because I think was, I have over seven thousand lectures on nuclear. Yeah. And that, that that is what I do is I I research nuclear beyond anything imaginable for the average person. I'm going to read uh, this stuff, and that I am able to. Uh, give you the, the accurate documentation because I learned it all and I was able to flush it, verify it, vet it, yeah. or I utter it, right? So that's why I'm a nuclear proctologist. My job is to be an oversight, to be a checks and balances, and well, to be the watchdog, to be the honest watchdog with no holes barred. Go ahead, I'm sorry. A, a lot of your, uh, uh you, you have photographs of before and after. Um, right, such. yeah. Uh, I found that quite alarming. Uh, it should be. That's Louise Nettles in Queen Charlotte was formerly, uh, Hardy Boy, formerly known as Queen Charlotte Islands in so, uh, British Columbia. It's uh, isolated, there's no industry there. And then I made uh, two trips through there. I blew up on, on the rocks, done $6,000 worth of damage from one of those oh. uh, expeditions, and 7,500 mile an hour yeah. wind all night long. Those are. And, uh, those are some amazing you, pictures. I'd like to get that documentation. Go ahead. On your, there's amazing pictures on your website. Um, my question is, with the recent um, anniversary, so to speak, of the Chernobyl incident, and how the IAEA seems to deem that as the worst nuclear disaster in history, <laughs> yeah. is Fukushima, in your opinion, worse than Chernobyl? And why was it not mentioned? Go ahead. Why was it not mentioned at all in this, right. the media oh, when the media was discussing Chernobyl? Right, and so if you look at, at Chernobyl, once again, Chernobyl is one third the size of any of the reactors in Japan. Chernobyl yeah. was a thirty percent meltdown. Chernobyl had stopped after ten days. So yeah. Chernobyl was actually a paper towel compared to and it was really bad, don't get me wrong, six hundred of the pilots died, the helicopter pilots. There were five thousand studies, there was over a million people. That uh, had that died because of that. Kafiana in 2000 said there was over 3 million children with permanent disabilities in Belarus. There's orphanages throughout uh, Belarus and Ukraine of uh, just disfigured and, and lumps of flesh of children that have been abandoned. Um, and we see that now. So they don't. They they just the nuclear industry almost died because of Chernobyl. And so Fukushima is the nail in the coffin if people wake up and understand it for the nuclear industry. The whole nuclear industry is predicated upon people thinking that it's like a banana or a potato chip or walking in sunshine, which are benign and harmless and innocuous and irrelevant and have nothing to do with what we're talking about. So Dana, I gotta go I gotta cut you off here. We gotta go to a quick video and we will be right back. We've got one last big question for you for our Shaw viewers. We'll be right back. No, I'm a better puppet. No, I'm a better puppet. No, I'm a better puppet. No, I'm a liar. I, I'm a better puppet. I got the hammers. I got the sickles. I got the angry mate, man face. Come on. We need to replace Stephen Harper. Wrong. 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 Who would be a better puppet than me? Um. Shana Pony. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's 2016. Shana Pony. Don't tune in to Freedom Free For All, Tuesday nights at 7.30 p.m. live. That show drives me crazy. They talk about climate change, freedom, liberty, Justin Trudeau being a shiny pony. Okay, welcome back to Freedom Free For All. We have to end up our Shaw segment tonight. Uh, Dana, I want to thank you for coming on. The live chat has gone Preserved. wild. <laughs> wild. So you want to log online and check that out. Dana, where can our viewers on Shaw and on the internet find more out about you? Is there a website, a social media outlet? Uh, do you have a YouTube channel? Right, uh, I do a five-day-a-week show at Beautiful Girl Boy Dana on YouTube, and I use TriCaster like you guys, um, and also nuclearproctologist.org for the documentation of the coastline of British Columbia, Canada, but I also cover that in my live streams each Perfect. day. Yeah. Brad, any final thoughts for our Shaw viewers? 
Uh, no, I'm, I'm just pretty blown away at the, how uh, contested uh, this uh, issue is. It, um, it is. Know, this is something that I would like to see uh, clarified. Yeah. I, I, I must admit, uh, I wish I was more informed. So for our viewers at home on watching this on Shaw, we go to an encore, which goes online after this. We have to end the show. So I'm going to ask Dana this last question. And for you to hear the answer at home, you're going to have to come online to our YouTube channel. Go to YouTube at freedomfreeforall.com to get the answer to this question. Dana, could... So what about sonar weapons? Uh, the U.S. Navy has been doing tests using sonar. So could some of the dead fish and the dead, the life be from sonar silent weapons? So for our viewers at home, you're going to have to come to our YouTube channel to check out the answer to that question. We will be back next week. Um, so thank you for tuning in. Come to us online. Come to us at Gorgeous Coffee. Be safe and be free. Hi everyone, I'm David Kevin Lindsay from CLEAR, the Common Law Education and Rights Initiative. In a world of banking and taxation fraud, media lies, judicial and political deception, and dishonest opportunists, there is hope, and you deserve the truth. This is Freedom Free For All. Welcome back to Freedom Free For All's Roundtable. The live chat has been going crazy, so welcome to the show. We were, t were talking with Dana Dunford, and the question is, what about sonar weapons? The U.S. Navy has been testing them in the area, so could some of the dead fish and the missing species, could they be from sonar silent weapons, Dana? Uh, well, sonar can certainly hurt and kill animals, but no one's going to dispute that one. But it doesn't account for how you can lose all the species in the tidal pools, how out of 300 species of birds you only end up with 11, how a half a million birds starve to dead. It doesn't explain how all the whales and mammals and seals and sea lions and the beaches are littered with those dead carcasses uh, throughout North America right now. It's reported on heavily. And they have all starved to dead. And so a sonar can affect a group of whales or a group of animals. But for to have uh, what we see as an extinction event, literally and figuratively, in every sense of that word, uh, playing out is not uh, feasible to even consider. Okay. And it, like it has throughout history. Yeah. We can have a brand uh, beach, not whales. But what we're seeing is not whales that are beaching that are healthy. We're not seeing animals that are, are dying from diseases or parasites yeah. or infections. What we're seeing are animals that are starved to death. So and the food chain is broken. And that's why they started it. Go ahead. Dana, there has been a lot of people talking about mass animal die-offs. Like there are, there are pictures of beaches with hundreds of dead uh, fish or squid or birds. Is this a result of Fukushima radiation, in your opinion? These mass animal die-offs. Well, there have been throughout history mass animal die-offs, uh, just random and no one's been able to explain it away, and, and sometimes they haven't even tried. Uh, but the animal die-offs that, that I'm talking about are the ones where they starved to death. And we're talking about also uh, many years of recording these numbers, uh, doing some strange activities or missing completely, and now we have the industry collapsing uh, throughout the coastline of North America. And all the industries have been collapsing uh, one in a snowball or chain reaction. But what we have proved was that the basis of the food chain is missing, the basis of the oxygen and the carbon sequestering chains are missing, this is the phytoplankton. Mm. And the glass is all why we have 75 to 100 million phytoplankton in a glass of water. And once again, when I was on the ocean for 260 days, I went right through these whole periods of the krill and the phytoplankton when it would normally come through in mass. And they were missing, but also all the animals and mammals and birds were also missing. And, and the reports we got are of mass starving. Uh, 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 fish famines is how they describe it in some ways. Now the seals and the sea lions in California, uh, they reported that the, the baby seals, now already, if they didn't have the right food and they depend upon krill and herring a lot, but if they couldn't find the food, they would come ashore and eat the rocks and they would suck the nutrients off the rocks, the algaes, the sea anemones, the whelks, snails and everything else. They would just suck all that up and they would excrete the rocks 
because now they have some nutrition in their body. Yeah. But what you found was the, the seals and the pups and everything with 10 or 15 pounds of rocks in their stomach, and that they were they had starved to death. And now we see the same thing with the polar bears in the Antarctic in the last couple of weeks where they came out and they said we might lose to all 3,200 polar bears in the north. This is the third year in a row that they are emaciated. They, they do claim that there was allegedly food up there, but that they said they couldn't explain why the animals were all emaciated. And I can't hear, I'm just saying, this is emblematic of, of the massive radiation releases from Japan, the, ma the massive amount of fallout, the disposition, and the massive amount that is continuous to come out. I want you to understand, everybody to really appreciate what I'm saying here, is that a chain reaction is not like a bomb. A bomb goes, it's gone in one millionth of a second. Yeah. And it might suck up a whole lot of rocks and everything if it's on the ground, and atom noise and aerosol and ion noise and radiate that material, and that becomes very dangerous to the human experience. But what I'm talking about is a chain reaction underground in a nuclear reactor with millions of pounds of, of liquid uranium, something we've never seen on this planet before, is verified. And that, that is consuming rocks and rebar and steel and cement and atomizing and aerosoling that. And, and like, it's hard to understand and appreciate the, the gravity of what I'm talking about. Because a gram of natural stuff, say potassium-40, would have about 160 atoms. It's 10 millionth of a curry. And a curry, in technical terms, is about 37 billion atoms. But a, a, gram of, a, a gram of natural would have about 160 atoms. But a gram of man-made is 88 times 37 a billion. So it's 88 curries times 37, which are a bill, 37 billion each yeah. of atoms. Now, you put 20 atoms on the head of a needle, you can't see it. But that's an invisible snowstorm when you're talking millions of pounds. Now, in order to get that grand, that's a million watts, they had to take 400 train cars of iron ore to get a gram. And they had to treat that with 400 train cars of chemicals and sophisticated technology as you get down to that gram. And then it's still not dangerous in the context of nuclear until it went through a chain reaction. Once it went through a chain reaction, it was 2 million times worse. Now, number three in Japan, reactor number three was mixed oxide fuel. This is where they reclaim uranium, reclaim plutonium from missiles, uh, from silos 40, 50 years old from the Cold War. This stuff had already went through a chain reaction. This is well known in the academic world. But what you ended up with was something two million times worse than any current reactor on the planet. And we only have 440 reactors on the planet. So what we have down there is something unhinged. We have what's known as a breeder reactor. And this stuff is creating more than we originally put in. It's atomizing and aerosoling and ionizing and radiating everything it consumes through that chain reaction that could be hitting temperatures of 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit temperatures. But this is why we have terrorist laws, and this is why we have nuclear waste sites just for that particular stuff. And we don't have it for bananas, we don't have it for potato chips, because that's good for you. And the body's acclimated to potassium-40 and natural radiation. And so the apologists will tell you that, well, Dana, there's more natural radiation out there than there is from man-made. Well, the problem being is that a single atom, and once again, you put two million on the head of a needle, but a single one, it'll sequester in your organs, in your muscles, and in your bones. And 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you have a, a vicious tumor because it's been attacked for that entire time by white blood cells trying to contain it for decades, and then it builds a sarcophagus, as we call it, a tumor. Uh, but what happens is you've got all these diseases and illnesses, 1,800 of them that will show up before the cancer, will be diagnosed and manifest before the cancer, and will cause people to liquidate their assets long before the cancer had showed up. So this is what makes cancer so, or radiation so dangerous, but because there was so much, so it's like this, if, if I, if I got a paint sprayer, and I'm spraying, just spraying randomly as I'm walking around. Well, that paint is not going to disappear. It's sticking to everything as I'm walking around. Yeah. And that's what radiation is doing. Like, cancer in country is stuck to everything. It's electrically charged. And this is why we're not seeing any species reclaiming the coastline. It's because the, the rocks are covered in radiation at low tide from the fallout. And then it's washing down from the mountains, and that's where it's ending up on the shorelines and the coastlines again, being re-liberated through that vector. Um, yeah, tens of thousands of miles of clouds. I have a... Uh, ocean every day. Go ahead. Yeah. I have a uh, one of your critics um, asking how much money do you make off of this? How do you make money off anything 
in the context of, I'm a researcher, we raised enough money to grow it on the ocean, and I had to stop and pour some weight to raise enough money to keep going. And when we done the whole coastline and came home. And so I'm an activist, I have an operation, and I try to raise money, I'm constantly trying to raise money, uh, to do what needs to be done and put the operation together, which is what I'm doing now. I, uh, I live stream a one hour show every day, uh, and I don't stop radio shows and everything else. And so, how can Greenpeace exist if people donate money, don't donate money to them? How can any activist organization exist if people don't mm. don't donate money to them? Yeah, that's reason. So, and then the money is spent on expeditions. And uh, I never ever uh, raise enough money to do the expeditions properly or to have the equipment that, that was necessary to do it, it professionally. And I probably will never get that opportunity because I'm just a, a normal everyday person like yourself who went out and took on that ocean, documented it, 2,000 pictures a day. And then when I came ashore, I spent months and months uploading that onto the website. And you can imagine 21 million pixel pictures and you're taking 2,000 pictures a day and you gotta upload that to your website when you get off the ocean after 260 days, which was months and months and months of agony. And, uh, you know, pictures wouldn't show up and you had to re-upload them again. So it wasn't able to use the internet for two months, two and a half months straight, just uploading pictures constantly, yeah. because that was so important. And so, so the, the people that are slandering me on the internet with these ad hominem, vicious, uh, slanderous attacks upon my character and the job work that i done, it means nothing to me, uh, you know, because I, it's up at the website. I done what I said I was going to do, and I've done a lot more than that. And people are stopped donating literally after I came off the ocean. Yeah. I was arrested and taken to Victoria. I've been in a Victoria court four yeah. times. Uh, I, yes. How, were you, uh, you were charged with uh, inciting violence because you criticized the CEO? I was, yeah, well, the Global Mail, the CBC done interviews. The Japanese Times on interviews, they came out with headlines claiming I was uh, a charge with uh, uttering death threats. That's a very serious charge. That was the headlines in the paper. I wasn't charged with that. I was charged with criminal harassment of nuclear pukes. And uh, criminal harassment of them being, I made YouTube videos. Now, what was interesting about this, I was charged with two videos. What I said in two particular videos. So you were charged. And I was, uh, just hear me up for one second. Yeah. I was charged. And so I get out of jail after 12 hours in jail when the police arrested me. Yeah. And what, what happened was there was ghost accounts. The ghost accounts knocked down those two videos I was charged with, not a court order. Wow. Give them a court order to take down 300 other videos. But the two videos that I was accused of saying salacious things in were knocked down by ghost accounts in that 12 hour period when I was in jail. Those same people tried to have me arrested in 2014 when I started talking about Fukushima. And what I done before I went on the ocean was I covered 9,000 headlines, live streaming 60 headlines at a time to 100 at a time. And so I was completely open with everybody and I had 25,000 supporting documentations. I had thousands of studies on radiation pre-Fukushima and post-Fukushima. I had... Uh, all the documentation in chronological order up at my website. At the bottom of each of the pages, you'll find hundreds of headlines so people can get their minds wrapped around it. I, I, am, uh, I have done everything because of the vicious attacks I've been under. And once again, I was arrested and accused of something I didn't do. And they used ghost accounts yeah. knocked down the videos I'm accused of doing it with That's instead of court orders. And then I give them a court order to take down 300 of my presentations. And so I still haven't went away. I still came back. In the year and a half period that I've been doing it originally, before I got arrested, I had 11 computers killed. Wow. 11 computers killed. So Destroyed. Dana, with your all of your research and your experience with the justice system now, would you say that your faith in government has been shaken? It's, it's uh, been destroyed. But in the context of, we got I, I, I don't believe when I finally get to court, even yeah. though the last judge says I couldn't use bananas and potato chips as context in, because... They said the science was set on it. That was like nuclear waste. Oh, the science. This is a lie, yeah, which is a lie, and I'm able to easily to prove a lie. <laughs> but this is what I'm up against, yeah. And so, yeah, my fate has been rattled. Yeah, well, you know, the government destroys everything it touches. We've got to end this interview with you, Dana. I really appreciate sure. you giving us the time. Um, we will definitely have to reconnect after this show. Do you have any final thoughts for our viewers? What can they do to find out more about Fukushima if they're concerned? They, they 
really should watch uh, my presentations at Beautiful Pearl by Dana on YouTube. Okay. So one of our presentations are a little slow starting off. Yeah. And that all the documentation is in each of the videos. Sometimes I'm a little crazy because I'm attacked so much. Yeah. But the doc all, all, all those presentations on different subjects, you'll see they have a lot of pick and choose. There's hundreds of them there. And I'm, I'm open and honest, and I'm available all the time for everybody. And I've been beaten, literally, and figuratively to death by this industry, but I'm still here every day. I don't hide from anybody. I don't pretend, uh, I don't, I'm living here in Powell River. I'm very open with my documentations up at the website. I don't know what else I'm supposed to do, and that's why I blog every day, because I see all this yeah. not enough. Well, so I blog every day to try to help people come to terms. And uh, we salute you and all that you do. So thank you for thank coming you, on our show, Dana. Thanks, Dana. Enjoy uh, the show. I appreciate it. Yeah, and for Folks, our viewers at everybody. home watching on the live stream, thank you for keeping it interesting. We do the show so that we can get everybody's voice out. Next week, we are talking about vaccines. We've got a doctor from UBC, I believe, talking about the validity of vaccines and how they might be dangerous. So you're going to want to tune into that. So until next week, until next Tuesday at 7.30 p.m., be safe and be free.